Um, so hello, welcome to the panel that's put on by the Robbins Library Teen Department today. It's on YA fiction and queer identity and just identity in general in YA fiction. We have some wonderful authors that I will introduce to you soon, um, but we are about to get started. So let's just hit a couple things. One, it will be recorded. So anything in the chat will show up as well. Uh, this panel is a part of our Pride programming this month. Make sure to check out robinslibrary.org slash events for all our other wonderful Pride programming. There will be one more panel put on by the teen department, which is a local drag artist, Wynne Tran, who performs as Jaden Jameson. She is usually our Pride King, uh, Pride Prom King. Unfortunately, we cannot host Pride Prom this year, but we hope to do it again next year and we will have Jane Jameson and Champagne back as our prom king and queen, but Wynne will be showing up to give us a wonderful talk. Check that out next week. Um, and so let me introduce to you our wonderful panelists. We have um, Charlie Jane Anders, who has written fabulous Victories Greater Than Death. I'm so excited. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's mm, gorgeous. We have Meg Elison who wrote find, find Layla, Finding Layla, Find Layla, right? Yeah, yep. I'm sorry, I keep thinking finding, but anyway. It's Nemo's fault. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Which is a realistic fiction about uh, just a lot of big, heavy feelings, but really good teen feelings. And then we have, last but not least at all, Darcy Little Badger, who wrote Elat Soe, and it's also beautiful. It's just so many beautiful books. I'm so excited. Thank you guys so much for doing this panel. I know it was sort of last minute and impulsive on my part. So thank you for participating. I'm so excited. Um, if you would like to go around and do like a quick little summary of your book, please feel free. I'm very bad at summary, so I did not myself. <laughs> Um, we will start, I think uh, we will go in order when I give you big questions. We'll go Charlie, Darcy, Meg, if that's okay. Okay. Sure, works for me. Okay. <laughs> I, can, I can fall on that sword. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just give a really quick, basically victory is greater than death. If you're like me and you ever just wish that aliens would come down out of the sky and take you away from this honestly disappointing planet that we're on, um, that's that's what Victory is Greater Than Death is about. It's about this teenage girl named Tina, who's known, I guess, since her 12th birthday that she's actually secretly an alien who was left on Earth as a baby, disguised as a human. And when she's old enough, when she's reached maturity, whatever that means, aliens are going to come and take her away and she's going to return to her life as an alien superhero. And so she's just been waiting and waiting and waiting for this to happen. And then it does. And it turns out that actually being an alien superhero is a little more complicated than she expected. And nothing is quite what she was hoping it would be. And she's actually, it turns out to be really lucky that she has like a found family of kids from Earth who are there with her to kind of help her get through this. Yeah, I guess it's uh, my turn for summary. Hopefully y'all can hear me okay. I'm in a, a courtyard, so if there's background noise, that's what's going on. <laughs> uh, yes, so Alatsue is a fantasy mystery book. Um, it's about a teenager named Ellie, and summer has just begun for her when she learns that her cousin has died. And in fact, she knows that he was murdered um, by a man named Abe Allerton. So it's not a whodunit. She knows immediately who murdered him, but she doesn't know why and she doesn't know how. Uh, and so she spends that summer with the help of her friends and her family and her ghost dog, Kirby, trying to solve this mystery and seek justice for her family. And in fact, Ellie has the ability to wake up the ghosts of animals. Uh, and these include Kirby, but they also include things like trilobites and uh, mosquitoes. Uh, so it, it's a bit of a a uh, mismatch of, of ghosts and magic and stories that span generations. And I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, if you haven't read, check it out. <laughs> 
So Find Layla is the story of a 14 year old girl experiencing extreme poverty in an urban environment in America. And it reflects on some of the difficulties of not only being poor, but working really hard to conceal how poor you are and the, the kind of adulthood that comes early on kids who experience a life like that. And I'll, most of it is written from my own experience, although you know not enough to hold up in court, it is in fact fiction. And it was really great to write it because I felt like it was a bunch of things I didn't have to carry anymore. And I, I sometimes get letters from people who are carrying something similar and it's been great to connect with them because it is often an experience that make you, makes you feel alone. Thank you all. Um, gosh, there's such good books. Um, one last note to attendees, we do have a very short Q&A session at the end. Um, feel free to throw your, Q, your questions into the box and we will get to them at the end. If there's anything particularly brilliant that I didn't think of, I am going to steal the question and pretend it was my own. Let's start, I suppose. Um, I do have a very hard hitting question for you all to start with. So I hope you're ready. This is my favorite question. Is a hot dog a sandwich? I would say yeah. I mean, I don't know. I would say yeah, for sure. Definitely. I was just doing my Portuguese class and I found out that in Brazilian Portuguese, the word for like cookies that are American style cookies is cookies. Uh, they, which I was like, why would you say biscoitos? And she was like, no, 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 we say biscoitos for Brazilian cookies, but for American cookies, we say cookies. I was like, that's so confusing. Anyway. No, I love that. Fact I learned an hour ago. <laughs> oh boy. So this is a tough one because I can honestly see both perspectives. Um, just from my own personal biases, if I hear the word sandwich shop, I don't think they sell hot dogs. So I want to say no. But if you give me a good argument for yes, I'm not going to turn it down. Uh, so personally, no, but OK, they could be anything. <laughs> I'm going to come out and say, yes, a hot dog is a sandwich, but a corn dog is a ravioli. Whoa, wait, what? <laughs> ravioli, but it's on a stick. You don't have raviolis on a stick. You could, like there's no law. I mean, I guess. So anything between bread is a sandwich. Anything fully enveloped in a coating is a ravioli, like a pop tart. I'm gonna, also a ravioli. I can see. I'm pop gonna tart. say, I'm gonna say a corn dog is a scepter. <laughs> oh, <laughs> an edible scepter. Okay. Does that make like like kebabs a scepter too? Because those are sharper too. Uh, yeah, I think possibly either a scepter or a weapon, depending on if it's a metal skewer. It could be like a, you know, anyway, these are these are really, really intense philosophical philosophical questions that we're I mean, dealing I had with. Start, had to start hard. <laughs> okay. So all of your books are, you know, very good, but all very different. I feel like identity plays a huge part in all of them though. Um, so how did your personal identity, any aspect of it, like any aspect of how you identify in society or just for yourself, how did that inform your novel and how did it inform your main character? And do you think it was more your teen identity or your identity now that really like shaped it? Wow, and I'm gonna answer this one first. Okay, um, yeah, so I mean, there's a whole kind of stew of identity in Victory's Greater Than Death. It's like, you know, obviously, like I said, it kind of comes out of my teenage, like, wish that somebody would just come and take me away from this freaking planet. And like, the alienation I felt as a kid, and especially as a teenager, and like having a learning disability, being a super nerdy kid with a learning disability is like super fun because like, you're nerdy, but you're bad at school. So you kind of get the worst of both situations. And, um, you know, and just like the, the kind of the, yeah, all the discomfort and alienation I felt as a teenager is kind of all in the book. Although, you know, it's not as right on the surface as it was in earlier drafts, but it's still in there, I think. Um, 
you know, obviously identity as a trans person is is important in the book. There's like one major trans character. There's also other characters who are queer in the book. You know, pretty much all the humans in the book are either canonically queer or kind of like, you know, their queerness is, is kind of implicit, I feel like. Um, and I, this was a thing that, you know, it's so funny. Like when I started working on this book in 2016, I was like, oh, is this going to get me in trouble? And by the time the book was coming out in 2021, there'd been a flood of queer YA and also trans teens were suddenly under this huge onslaught of, a, of assaults. And suddenly this thing that I had kind of thought of as like something I was going to have to keep apologizing for became, it's like that I told my agent, hey, I just don't want to freak you out, but there's a lot of queerness in this book. Like, I hope, you know, please don't freak out, agent. And he was like, whatever, I don't care. Um, he was like, do what you got to do, basically. But I thought I was going to say I was going to have to apologize for it. And instead, it kind of became, you know, something that I was kind of proclaiming as like, this is a thing in this book that I'm really happy is in here because it feels timely. Um, but also, I mean, you know, uh, I'm somebody who, like I said, I had a learning disability. I have like a lot of like anxiety about dealing with people sometimes. And I feel like that kind of comes out in the character of Rachel, who's this kind of hermity introvert artist who has to hide away from people. I'm not as extreme in that as Rachel. I'm as obviously very capable of getting in front of a, a giant crowd and, and just talking and just, you know, whatever. But um but I have that side to me that's that's huge where I'm just like, ah, people must run away. And you know, when I'm at conventions and other things like that, I do have like get overwhelmed and have to run and hide in my room pretty often. And so, you know, so I think that there's like various aspects of who I am embedded in this book. Yeah, that was a really beautiful answer. Uh, tough one to follow. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, that's the thing with being on a panel with amazing people is you're always like get engrossed in the answers and they're like, oh man, it's my turn. <laughs> um, but yeah, Elatsui, the main character, I guess shares two components of my identity. First, she's lip on Apache. Uh, I'm also lip on Apache. Uh, I do like to say like I'm biracial. My father's Irish American. My mother is Apache. Uh, but that I'm still all lip on Apache because it, it's not the sort of thing that we, we say we're half of anything. Um, so culturally, she shares a lot of the culture that I grew up in, including when, when I discuss ghosts in Alatsawe, the, the way that, that ghosts kind of manifest themselves, both animals and people, is just strongly based on our understanding of the afterlife and ghosts. Uh, and on the other hand, she is asexual. Actually, um, Ellie is arrow ace, so aromantic asexual. Um, I'm asexual myself. Um, I'm engaged to another asexual uh, native, uh, T. They're Navajo, I'm Apache. Uh, we both have Irish American fathers. I don't know how that works out, but it's pretty fun. Um, but when I think about, there, there's a couple of reasons why Ellie has these, these components of my identity. And first, surely when I was growing up, I, I didn't read a lot of books that, that had either. And I don't just mean as main characters, I mean as any character. I don't think I ever read a book with a lip on Apache character in it. Um, I can't remember as a teenager finding any books with ace characters. Uh, fortunately, that's become, it's become better with time. Um, but there's still a long way to go because I remember when I first written a Latsoe and I was going to, I was publishing as a YA book, a young adult book. And I was told that young adult readers wouldn't want to read about a book without a romance. And I know that's not true because young readers want to read about many things. So I think sometimes people think they know the minds of young readers without actually knowing it. Um, but I'm glad I didn't take that advice um, because I've heard back from a lot of ACE readers who are like, well, I'm seeing myself in this adventure. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm reading the comments. Yeah, it, it's, it's tricky. They, they wanted me to sell it as a middle grade. I was like, no, this deals with a lot of like, it's a very solidly YA book. The main character is 17. The themes are, are kind of dark sometimes. It goes into death and revenge and justice and, and grieving. Um, but so, so yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. And it's, it, it's also, you know, it's just, I, I wrote it as a YA book. Um, so, so yeah, uh, the other hand, I, I also, it's so much easier to write what you know than to research something else. 
So in terms of making Ellie live on Apache, I mean, that's just what I grew up as. That's what I know. I don't have to try to research what would it be like to be someone who, who isn't lip on. Uh, so it, it's kind of also just the, the easy way as, as me as a writer. Um, but it, it was cool putting this book out and seeing for the first time that many different readers, not necessarily native readers or ace readers, just readers of all sorts were connecting with the characters. And I think that's really cool. And it goes to show that young readers, they want to read about a variety of experiences and they don't have to be their own necessarily to connect with them. I have some similar things to say. I, I definitely was frustrated as a kid that there weren't any models for the kind of poverty that I was experiencing. I remember a number of notable examples. I remember the book Blue Willow, which is about a kid whose, par whose parents are itinerant farm workers and deals with the realities of eviction and of uh, extreme economic oppression. I remember uh, The Great Gilly Hopkins by Catherine Patterson, which is about a kid who winds up in foster care, who loses control of her destiny in much the same way that I did as a kid. And then more recently, I read a wonderful book by Rex Chapman called Free Lunch. And it's it focuses specifically on the humiliation grade school kids and, and elementary and uh, middle school kids endure when everybody realizes how disadvantaged they really are. So this is not to say these books don't exist. It's just that I've not run across them and I always want to be corrected in that. I'm never going to say I'm the first, but there aren't as many as there should be. And there certainly weren't any kids as poor as I was on TV. I was really into Roseanne because at least they had their power turned off sometimes, but you know, they owned a house. So I, I lived through like a number of life altering cataclysmic evictions and periods of, of living unhoused and food insecurity and stuff that kids in the books that I read and I loved that they got to go to wizard school and have adventures but I couldn't always relate. <laughs> so it was important to me to write a book that represented that experience in a very visceral and real way so that if you know you know if you've been there you can see that I, I, I know whereof I speak. And then the other thing I was thinking about specifically with respect to this panel is there is an expectation among queer people that we will always be the best dressed and most fabulous person in the room. I love that and I want to live it every day, but damn, does it take money. <laughs> so there was immediately within my soul a terrible clamor as a kid when I realized the people who I wanted to be like and be with, I was never going to be cool enough. And it wasn't because I didn't belong and it wasn't because I wasn't one of them. It was because I couldn't put it together. I couldn't look as though I belonged. And that is complicated by race and gender and definitely class and I mean, the shape of your body by all things. So by the time I had the idea of the character of Layla, I was mostly writing about a kid who had to hide almost everything about who she was. And while it's not directly about my experience of realizing I was queer at a very young age, it's definitely in there. I didn't even really think about, yeah, having to try and present as queer while being very, very poor. Like that is such a an interesting thing to think about. Um, well, you all sort of touched on my second question and I guess that's sort of the, the hazard of getting very smart people on a panel together, <laughs> but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, and it's, uh, that YA very specifically. So Melinda Lowe is an Arlington native um, and she used to do the queer YA like survey and seeing how many books were queer versus not. And it has been trending upwards very, you know, quick, quickly, but not fast enough for my taste, but we are getting more and more um, but especially like you were talking about Charlie, Charlie Jane, you were like saying that when you were writing it in 2016, you were worried that maybe it would have more pushback, but now in 2021, it's sort of, you know, I'm, I'm sure you might still get pushback, but like there's, there's more books to even like hold up with your book that have queer and trans protagonists and, you know, even aliens representing it. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Basically, can you talk to like, were you consciously trying to, to fill a, a hole that you wanted to see in young adult fiction? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it's complicated, obviously. I mean, I think it's it's definitely true that in terms of trans people writing YA about trans characters, it's there's been just like a huge explosion in the last couple of years, uh, similar to what there's been in science fiction, actually, in like in adult science fiction and fantasy. Um, you know, I wrote a thing for Teen Vogue back at the start of the year where I was like, here's the books, here's some books coming out this year, YA books from trans and non-binary authors with trans and non-binary characters. And I, there were too many books for me to include in that article. I had to kind of pick and choose a little bit because that was such a, you know, there was, there was so much and I had a word count limit. And uh, so that was really exciting. But, you know, if you look at uh, the American Library Association, I guess, does a list of banned and challenged books every year books that are banned and challenged and, you know, it used to be kind of, you know, 1984 or, you know, some other books that are kind of, or Brave New World or whatever. And if you look at the last like several years, it's all books for kids and teenagers about trans people. It's people like Alex Dino and other authors like that. Like the books that are most banned and challenged now are books for, for kids about transness. That is the thing that they are going after the hardest right now. So it is, it's a fraught time. And, you know, I think it's on all of us to kind of really support that kind of writing. Uh, in terms of like my thought process in like making the characters as queer as they are in the book, I never, I never really think of it from a standpoint of like, you know, what can I do to be more inclusive? I think of it from a standpoint of just like, what's interesting about this character? What, what can I get into about this character? What can I find about this character that I like or that I can relate to? And sometimes I will, you know, for some of my previous books, I would have a character where I experimented with like adding more or less queerness. And it was about what serves the character best and what works in the story and what works with the world you're doing. And so, you know, sometimes you don't quite get there with a character because it just isn't clicking. And, you know, I can go into that more if you all want, but with, with Victory is Greater Than Death, it just, for various reasons that every time I was creating a character, they just started getting more queer in my mind. And like having Elsa, this sort of travesty trans character from Brazil, she just kind of took on a life of her own and it was just so fun to write her. And like other characters, like, you know, one of the things that really helped me to get into my protagonist, Tina, is like early on, she says someone, to someone casually, yeah, my sexual orientation is that I'm really picky. And like, I felt like that was such a teeny thing to say that she's not, she doesn't identify as like by her pen, she identifies as picky. Like she's, she's, she's not ace or arrow. She just, she has a hard time finding people that she's into and, and they can be any gender, but she's really picky. And I thought that was a really fun way of putting it. So I just, stuff like that, just it kind of, you know, anything that I'm always just kind of trying to get a handhold on my characters, anything that will make me want to write about them, want to know more about them. And sometimes that's more queerness. And when that happens, I'm, I'm delighted, but it just really is, you know, it's, it's not something that I can consciously kind of steer towards or away from, I think. Yeah, um, in terms of the whole, I, I guess I was conscious when I wrote Alatsue of this lack of native uh, science fiction fantasy YA books, uh, then you add that the main character is ace, that, that's even more rare. Um, so I was conscious of that. And sometimes it was actually intimidating, um, but I just wrote the book because I felt like it. And I figured like, whether it's published or not, at least I wrote the story of my heart. Uh, and when it was published, um, that was just really cool. Uh, it, it, what, I, what I am most really happy with though is just the reception from readers because for me that's what's most important so I don't know if I'll ever like get a multi-million dollar deal off of writing about ace natives but um, I certainly have already connected with readers which is like as a writer I, I, I think for most of us that's what really is important I would definitely say that in my case it was an intentional choice Throughout my career, my modus operandi has been to think, what's the book you really wish you were reading right now? And can you find that? No. Do you have to write it now? Yes. So everything that I have written has arisen out of a desire for that book to exist for me personally, but also for people other than me. Someone actually just said something in the chat, which, uh, which brought it to me very simply. And it's, there is someone out there who needs to read a book about a person like the character you're creating. They need it badly. They need it to become themselves. They need it to live. I've found those books. I have found the books that I have needed to live. 
and I've it's been the thrill of my life better by far than getting a royalty check but don't tell my publisher I said that to hear from people who say that my book helped them in some way to accept themselves or to accept someone close to them and to understand an experience I mean that's what novels are for they're for empathy so it's been the greatest gift to know that that can happen and does sometimes happen because of the hallucinations I put down on a page. I'm just like tearing up over here, but that was wonderful. Um, part of what I like about being a librarian is connecting with kids like me and helping them find books that will bring that about. So I really connect with, yeah, just trying to help people find themselves in fiction and that's wonderful. Um, so there's something that I often find in YA because I'm reading so much so often for both pleasure and for work is that there are just some authors that when they're writing YA novels, you can tell they just haven't talked to a teenager probably since they were a teenager. And the, the voice of the main character and even the novel can feel very inauthentic to teenagehood of modern day or just in general. So how I felt very like strongly connected to all of your characters. It felt like very teenage, even if you're an alien or, you know, just it, they, they felt very teenage to me as someone who, who works with many, many teenagers. I could imagine them in my library. So like, how, how'd y'all do that? How did you find that, that voice to make it feel genuine? Wow. I mean, that's one of the hardest parts for me about writing YA because I wanted to do a good job. I feel like, you know, YA, I love YA. I'm a huge fan of YA and I didn't want to disgrace the genre by doing a kind of, you know, half-assed job or whatever. Um, so, you know, I, in terms of like the writing style and the narrative voice, I kind of sat down with a bunch of YA books and just kind of looked through them and just like looked through which ones are first person, which ones are third person, past tense, present tense. How are they, you know, how are they kind of approaching the opening page, but also some of the big moments and just kind of tried to kind of get the soak in all of the genre. And actually the sequel to Victory is Greater Than Death is third person, so it's a little bit different. But, you know, getting Tina's voice was really important to me and having like, I love a really snarky kind of like, you know, uh, opinionated kind of like, you know, slightly obnoxious narrator. And so that's always really fun to write. There, I do, uh, Anna Lee, my partner lives with a, lives in the house with a, a couple of kids, one of whom is a teenager now and is, you know, we hang out a lot. And so that's been really good. And I have a nephew who's now, I think just turned 13, but you know, mostly I just try to like, you know, pay attention to the kids around me. And also the thing I think that people often don't understand about teenagers, I think, is that teenagers can be very serious. They can be very almost solemn. They can be very kind of like, you know, and I think that one of the failure modes of adults writing teenagers is that they have to just be sarcastic all the time or that they just have to be like, nothing matters, I don't care about anything. And like when I was a teenager, when, you know, when I, the teenagers I know now often are just like heartbreakingly serious in a way that adults maybe would 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 have like some defense mechanism around like I'm not going to actually say what I'm really thinking or feeling because like but teenagers sometimes will just you know especially with each other they will just put it out there and they will be real and they will actually you know share their thoughts and feelings in a way and and be kind of like very serious and I, I find that you know really amazing and awesome and I wish that more adults were like that so I don't know that's all I got yeah, I was just thinking um, that when I was a teenager, I didn't talk to teenagers uh, because so my family moved a lot. And when we when I was 12, we moved from Iowa to Vermont. And that's kind of when I lost friends. So throughout my teenage years, throughout middle school and high school, I didn't have any friends. So I did. I, I genuinely was like selectively mute at school. I didn't talk to my peers for my entire teenage years. Um, so that, that gave me a kind of interesting, I, I never really grew up socializing with people my age until college. Uh, but then again, that's not uncommon. There are lots of people like me. There are lots of teenagers right now who are struggling with bullying, who might not have friends. And that was my experience. Um, 
but of course, when I when I write now, trying to think of what the voice of my character should be, um, it makes it difficult because not only did I lack that kind of socialization when I was a teenager, now I am a I am a no spring chicken. I'm in my 30s, so <laughs> I'm not going to try to pretend like fellow kids and all that. Um, so it helps writing things in alternate universes like Alatsue and A Snake Falls to Earth take place in a, in a world similar to ours, but I don't have to worry too much about trying to remain current um, with, with certain like linguistic trends that might come and go in the matter of like a few years. Um, on the other hand, I, I don't like patronize teenagers because like teenagers are like complex and intelligent and, and just when I write a character, both teenage and adult, like I try to write people and I'm not going to, to, to like, I don't know, think of, think of age as, as some sort of like different species once 10 years younger than me, you must, you must not be like, no, of course not, we're all human. Um, and yeah, just thinking about when I was young, that was a very like painful time for me, but it was also a time when I was um, thinking about philosophy of, of like life and, and just all these really grand and complex subjects. Uh, so yeah, if anything, like I, I don't know if my if my voice in terms of like language is always as current as, as it necessarily should be, but I, hopefully I, I that respect I have for teenagers comes through. Um, if there's any teenagers watching, um, I you know I, I respect you. <laughs> right. I agree with everything said so far. I do think that there is a tendency for uh, YA authors, especially the ones who are who primarily identify as the parents of teenagers to make them into a character rather than a person because parents experience the brunt of the worst part of that, of, of that period. I, I get that, I do. But I'm a champion eavesdropper. It's how I write all of my dialogue. I love being where people are and listening to the way they talk and picking up their idiom and their, their specific uh, dialect and when I eavesdrop on teenagers, and I don't mean to say that I invade anybody's privacy, I only do this in public spaces, like I overhear them at a Starbucks or a library. But uh, Charlie Jane and Darcy are both right. They are concerned with politics and cosmology and philosophy, and they are really trying to make sense of the universe. They are at times shockingly emotionally vulnerable with one another. Many of them have the tendencies of a much younger child when they are not sure how to handle their biggest feelings, when they're lonely or scared or grieving. And at other times, they'll be incredibly adult. They'll be pragmatic and they'll see the big picture and they'll see straight to the solution of something. And it is that mixture of childhood and adulthood and the god awful stew of hormones that that period in your life puts you through that makes them so interesting to listen to. But really, the answer is listening it is the only way to do it and not to just the kid in your house who won't clean their room but to all kinds of kids and to figure out what the voice of a teenager is really like i did fall a little bit into the trap of remembering what it was like when i was that age and i got very good help and this is something that i recommend to anybody who wants to be a writer i have a writer's group and they were able to point out and say that kids don't use this word anymore it doesn't mean what you think it means look it up on urban dictionary stop saying that <laughs> And it was great to get that kind of feedback and to put it to work, but I cannot recommend eavesdropping enough. Yes, I, I also want to know what the word was that you used. It was bitching. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> you know, I gotta, I gotta say that, like, I very much tried not to have current teen slang in my book because I was like, A, it'll be dated by the time, like if I'm writing it and starting to write it in 2017 and it's published in 2021, it'll be dated by the time it comes out and somebody might buy it like three years after it comes out and it'll be dated. But also I didn't want to be that like older person being like, yeah, I'm using all the latest lingo that the kids are using. And like, I just, I felt like it was a minefield. So I was just like, you know, I'm just gonna like write, I'm just gonna not have a lot of slang in the book and like have pop culture references but not slang. That was like, I don't know. That's that's honestly one of the best ways to do it. Nothing really dates a YA book quite like, like just trying to use teen slang. And yeah, I, I have read many books where I'm like, oh, I can tell exactly what month of what year this book was being written in. <laughs> 
but they're yes. all these kids and they just wouldn't stop dabbing. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, a particular book that I read and I don't want to call out the author or anything, but the teenagers kept just making references to Yogi Bear and it was supposed to be like modern day. And I was very taken out of the book. <laughs> it was very strange. Um, so yes, thank you for thinking about teenagers just a just a little bit um they really are great human beings I've based my career around them so I'm biased but <laughs> um speaking of which my last question before we get to the Q&A is a very self-indulgent one but what role did libraries or did you wish libraries had played in your own teenagehood you know, I mean, gosh, I did spend a lot of time in the library when I was both a little kid and a teenager. Like my parents would just drop me off at the library and it'd be like, you know, I wouldn't even know how long they were gone. I was just like, oh yeah, okay, I live here now. This is great. You know, there's books, there's, you know, I'm not gonna run out of stuff to read anytime soon. And so that was pretty much like, I have like all these memories of just basically just like hanging out at the library and like, you know, that was like, it was, it was really important to me. And like, I don't know, when I was in a teenager, you know, I had all this assigned reading that was like this giant kind of like, so I would kind of cheat on the books I was supposed to be reading for school and just kind of go to the library and just like, ha ha ha, I'm gonna read these other, and I don't know. There were books that I was just like obsessed with as a teenager that I would just like suck up at the library. Like, you know, all of the, um, you know, these like fantasy series that I was obsessively reading. So I don't know. That's that's all that's all I've got, I guess. But I love libraries, I love librarians, and I love spending time in them. And I'm glad that we're finally getting back to being able to go into them again. Yeah, I was thinking libraries um, from when I was a kid in elementary school up through high school and then like into college and, and obviously now. Um, so they've always been one of my favorite places. Uh, reading was really, uh, one of the sources of joy that I've always had like growing up since I, I learned how to read when I was very young. Uh, and I have to say like in terms of my family, libraries were also important to my mother who grew up uh, in McAllen, Texas. Uh, her father actually worked at a Goodyear store. She had, you know, before he passed away, um, she had many siblings and the library was the one safe place they could go because it was quite dangerous where they lived. So they would go to this library and my mother would sneak out into the sci-fi fantasy section. Uh, and not only is that where she really learned English and cultivated um, uh, that language skill, it, it's also where she learned to have this love for sci-fi and fantasy that was passed on to me. And I, now I write the stuff. So um, really libraries like in generation uh, to generation have been so for important uh, to, to me and to my mother, like just growing up. Um, so yeah, I just, just thank you for all that you do as a librarian. I also grew up in libraries. It is, uh, it is difficult to overstate how useful a library is to the poorest people in a community. There is so much access and so many resources that are available through public libraries that once you find out about, you just never stop using them and it's the best thing. So I caught on to that at a very early age. My family was itinerant because my father was military and then just because poverty is often itinerant. And everywhere I went, I knew that there would be a public library where I was authorized to exist without having any money, which is amazing if you can just hang out there and read books and there's a bathroom and it's clean and it's safe and there's a, a water fountain. So I wrote into Layla the concept of where can I hide out during the day when I don't have anywhere to be, when I need to charge my phone, when uh, there is no one in charge of me and no one who is friendly to my existence. And the answer to that is the library. And I am very proud to uh, to belong to and to support my local libraries now, and also to live with a partner whose job is in public libraries and to be supported by it in turn. Uh, cannot say enough good things about that. Also, everybody thinks it's adorable when they say, well, what do you do? And I say, I'm a writer. And they say, well, what does your partner do? And I say, he's a librarian. And they're like, aw. <laughs> I mean, that is absolutely adorable. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to read some of these questions because they're very good questions. Uh, we only have two, but again, very good questions. So first one, 
comes from Noah, who has been in the chat. Hi guys, I'm Noah and I really want to be a writer. I don't know how to start my book. How do you come up with a first sentence? It seems impossible. Lots of love, your teenaged envy. And then there's a rainbow and a heart. Uh, sorry, I'm just muted. Yeah, I mean, you know, getting started is really hard and opening sentences are often, it's just like you're staring at like a blank document or a blank screen or whatever, and it's or a blank piece of paper. And just like getting into it is really hard. And, you know, um, I mean, sometimes I just pretend that I'm telling a story to a friend. And I'm like, you know, gosh, I was just minding my own business and this thing fell out of the sky on top of me. Or, you know, I was just, gosh, you know, I... Like just trying to kind of start at the beginning, I guess. And like, you know, when I'm writing, I always know that the first draft is going to be kind of rough around the edges. I'm going to be just kind of putting down some stuff and I'm going to be figuring out, like, even if I kind of know what the story is and events, I'm going to be figuring it out as I go a lot. And so it's going to just be a process of, you know, it's the first draft is going to be kind of a rough draft. It's going to be a, it's going to be kind of rough around the edges. And I know that I'm going to go back and change it. And often the first sentence that I write, like, is not the actual first sentence that's going to be the first sentence of the thing when it's, you know, when I share it with other people necessarily. That's usually not the case. Like, I'm trying to remember if it's ever, if I've ever used the first sentence that I wrote. Like, I don't think I have. I think if you, you know, if you looked at like my early drafts of All the Birds in the Sky or Victory's Greater Than Death, the first sentence was very different. In fact, I posted somewhere about how the first sentence of All the Birds in the Sky had changed. And the original first sentence was not that great, to be honest. I feel like the thing that a first sentence has to do for me personally as the writer is make me want to know what the second sentence is. Like, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to know what it is, but I have to want to know. I feel like, okay, that first sentence that I just wrote, I really need to know what happens after this. It has to make me curious because I feel like the thing that writing, just like reading, you want to know what happens next and what comes after this. And so the first sentence should lead to a really interesting second sentence, which should lead to a really interesting third sentence. And so it's just like, what would make you personally curious about the story? And that's an, a thing that only you can answer. But like, what is it that like that first sentence is just going to be like, oh, I want to see where this goes, you know? And like I said, you could change it later, but just that's how you just pulling yourself into the story is kind of the job of it. And just getting over that kind of fear of putting stuff on that page and like not being perfect because it's not going to be perfect. Yeah, just to reiterate what Charlie Jane um, just said, I'm thinking of my next book. It, it's, it's called A Snake Falls to Earth and it's coming this October. And I'm like, how many times did the beginning change? So actually, uh, I, wrote, I wrote the book then I edited it and then I edited it again. And that's when I decided to put a whole new first chapter into the book. Um, and oftentimes like I, I do have trouble with the intro, introduction or the very end of, of a book length project because like there's so many different possibilities and, and sometimes you kind of um, psych yourself out with, with how, how significant that intro can be introducing people to the story. And just when my head gets into that place of not knowing what to write, I just don't write it. And usually uh, once I proceed with a story, it gets easier and easier to write. And then suddenly one day it'll come to me the way I want to begin this book or this story. And sometimes that does change like it did with A Snake Falls to Earth. And I have to say, I rewrote the end for that. Um, six different times. And these weren't, these weren't little rewrites. These are like significant rewrites. And that's what I love about editing because it gives you that second chance to just really consider what you want your book to be. And I have to say that it's really cool that you wanna be a writer uh, and, and good luck because the, the world needs your stories. 100% that please write stories that only you can write, get into it, be a writer. It is the best job on earth that I don't want to do anything else. First sentences are really hard. And as Charlie Jane said, most of the time, the sentence you start with is not going to make it. You're just priming the pump. You're just getting yourself going. I often steal. I will take the first line of something else that I really liked and use it just as the jumping off point. I know I'm going to delete it anyway, so it doesn't matter if I open the story with Call Me Ishmael. There are a couple of my books and stories where you can see the fingerprints 
of the line that I stole, my third novel, The Book of Flora, opens with a direct reference to Last Night I Dreamt I Went to Mandalay Again from De Maurier's Rebecca, which is one of the best opening sentences of all time. Because for once I came back to it and said, oh, that's actually not bad. I should keep that. So once you do that, once you're a fancy thief, you can call it homage. But I cannot recommend enough that you imitate the voices of writers you'd like to be like and steal because it is how we all begin. Uh, I love that. I want, I want to like, just write that down if you're fancy enough. Oh, homage. Okay. Love it. Stealing that from you, Meg. Um, our second question comes from Tessa Fisher. YA as a genre is rapidly gaining a reputation for inclusiveness. What might it take to expand this inclusiveness into other genres and the larger literary publishing world? Dang, Tessa, don't pull those punches. I mean, I think that across the board, there's more inclusiveness the last like, you know, several years through the hard work of, you know, folks like, you know, the folks behind We Need Diverse Books and, you know, other movements to try to like drag publishing and, and the book world kicking and screaming into, you know, the population as it exists in, in, you know, in the world and in this country. Uh, we have, a, I think YA has a long way to go. I think YA is still, if you look at like the, the kind of who's, who's getting like the, the most attention in YA and like the, the preponderance of YA books, it's still not what it should be. I think YA still has a long way to go. You know, when you look at how hard it was for, you know, the hate you give to find a publisher. Like, I think she went through like dozens of publishers and that book is just, what were these people thinking? What were these people thinking? I think that, you know, so YA still has a long way to go. Definitely as someone who's steeped in kind of adult science fiction and fantasy, they have a long way to go. Uh, I, I, I don't know if YA is more inclusive at this point than you know, adult genres. I feel like that's a really tough question that I don't feel qualified to answer. Uh, I think that they neither neither a YA nor adult genres are diverse enough or inclusive enough. And I think that you know, unfortunately, it really has to happen more behind the scenes. I think that the problem that we're having is, you know, similar to a lot of other things where it's like you have inclusion in front of the camera or inclusion in like the front lines, but not behind the scenes enough. Like, I think that, you know, publishing is still extremely white, extremely cis, extremely het, extremely kind of, you know, middle-class, extremely like, you know, probably there's like, I don't even know, I don't wanna get, but publishing, I, I love many of, the people who work in publishing, like I would say most people who work in publishing are among my favorite people because they love books and they are such beautiful, you know, creative people who just are like pouring their hearts into making great books happen. But they will be the first to tell you that publishing has a real problem with not being inclusive enough behind the scenes. And it's, we're never gonna get enough inclusiveness or the right kind of inclusiveness on the, the, the names on the fronts of the books if the names of the backs of the books don't change. So that's what we really need to work on across the board. Yeah, I just gotta say, I agree. Um, and um, I'm a big horror fan. I, I read a lot of horror, I watch a lot of horror and there is a lot of room for um, improvement in, in that genre in particular. Uh, and I do think that if we had more editors, more publish, publishing people, like, like Charlie said, behind the camera, you know, um, that would help. Uh, so I, I know of some projects, some horror anthologies that are edited by really cool teams that I'm really looking forward to. Uh, so I, I am optimistic about the future and it's something that we just keep, need to keep pushing for. I want to go one step further. I agree that publishing is overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly uh, 
cis white women for some reason is just like running publishing and and it's really difficult for them to to recognize good work when they see it if it's too far from their own experience or to know that a market absolutely exists that cannot wait to fork over their money for it so uh i agree that publishing needs to diversify it needs to diversify not only at the bottom not only with interns and slush pile readers but with acquiring editors managers and editors in chief most of all beyond that we need to destroy capitalism so that publishing doesn't work the way that it does so that everybody makes enough to live on so that we all have universal basic income and writers don't worry about the wolf at the door so that publishers don't fret about something never selling because we wouldn't be stuck in this horrible way so yes and destroy capitalism yeah i'm a big land back person and i gotta say i see a question about these earrings and these were gifts but i think they're from etsy um and i know that meg said earlier you knew of of that you can get these things like these on etsy so i would say probably there but yeah, most of my cool stuff are gifts from my fiance. So <laughs> fiance, no, I have the exact same earrings, which is what I was telling Darcy, except the rose at the bottom is red instead of uh, turquoise, which, you know, suits me. But if you just search skull cameo earrings, you will find them. I have to say, I am I'm proud that uh, this panel has ended up in destroy capitalism. It's that makes my heart very warm and happy. Um, Darcy, I just you touched on land back and it's one of my like pet favorite kind of like things and I tell people about it all the time would you mind just like going into it just a little I would love to have it just talked about <laughs> oh well I could oh sorry someone's trying to call me I have to decline them all right there I go I'm back I have to say from my perspective so I'm lip on Apache and in the the mid to hundreds essentially um, that's when, you know, after Texas became a state and the federal government decided that they were going to take our land and kill us. Um, so because we were to, for the most part, go on a reservation, there are some lip on people who are suffering from who did go on to a reservation. Um, but most of, most of them, my ancestors in particular, resisted and we were subject to massacres from both the United States and Mexico. And what we end up now is that we have no, our homeland is we're struggling. Um, I know my mother just for the first time in her entire life, she's 65. She finally has land in Texas and it took her entire life just to be able to live without renting the land of our people. Um, and so the, the Lip on Apache people, um, we're, we're currently in a battle to receive um, more recognition, to receive more resources. But what we really need right now is our land, because this is our homeland, and we should not have to rent it from our colonizers. So that's what I mean when I mean land back. I mean that for indigenous people, it is so important that we are connected to our land. And right now, too many of us are, are, are still suffering from that period of colonization. Uh, so it's very personal and <laughs> actually get into it in my second book. Um, <laughs> oh, my fiance's here. Does everyone want to see? Come say hi to the people, T. Yes. <laughs> hi, T. <Cheers. tea. laughs> <All right. laughs> but yeah, I could I could go on, but but yeah, I do. Um, so yeah, help the lip on people. We we need we need support um, now. I know we went through a very tough period uh, during the pandemic. So that was something that I was really involved with trying to get, uh, you know, resources to our people that would keep us safe. And, and there was a lot of suffering. And, and so yeah, it, it's ongoing. Um, that that period of colonization, its terrible impacts have not ended They're They're still impacting us today. <laughs> so sorry to take this in a in a completely different non YA direction. But yes, no, I that's literally what it needs to be. <laughs> Thank you so much for for indulging me there. I just, I wanted to touch on that more. Um, I guess we are going to wrap up. If you all wouldn't mind saying where we could find you on the internet, um, if you have anything you'd want to plug besides your book or also your book, um, and if you want to say anything to the teens watching, please do. Yeah. Uh... You know, please keep writing, please keep reading and like dreaming of different, better worlds and like help us to destroy capitalism. Uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, Charlie Jane. Uh, my website is charliejane.com. 
I have another book coming out in August because why, I don't know. Uh, I have a book coming out in August called Never Say You Can't Survive, How to Get Through Hard Times by Making Up Stories. And it's, you know, writing advice. So if, if y'all want more advice about writing, there's a whole book of it coming out in August. Uh, and then in November, I've got a short story collection coming out called Even Greater Mistakes. And then the, th the second book in the, the trilogy of Victories Greater Than Death comes out in next April. You're not busy at all or anything. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's so exciting to hear. Um, yeah, I'm. I guess I'm most active on on Twitter in terms of social media, but I also have an Instagram. Uh, Twitter, I'm Shining Comic, and on Instagram, I'm Doctor Period Little Badger because I do have a PhD in oceanography, so I have a, a doctorate in oceanography. So that's I'm Doctor Ocean. Uh, and my next book is A Snake Falls to Earth um, this October. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I like posting pictures of my of of, of me, my family, and my pets on Instagram. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's the next big thing, exciting. Uh, thank you so much for, for having me on this panel and, and for listening to, to everything that I had to say. Uh, to any teens who are listening, uh, Charlie Dance, write, write your stories, make your art, dance your dances. Don't let anybody talk you out of the things you know are true. I have been working for the last 20 years to regain what I knew was true when I was 15 because the world will try to beat it out of you. Don't let them. If you're interested in more of my work, I have a, a silly little blog at MeggieListen.com. I'm MeggieListen on Twitter. I'm MeggieListen on Instagram. I am MeggieListen on Patreon. It's been a real pleasure to be with you here today and uh, thank you for being here with me. Oh, we lost, we lost Charlotte and Jane for a second, but I just, I wanted to say, Thank you, all th three of you. It's been absolutely wonderful. Thank T for making a brief cameo. That was wonderful. Um, yeah, thank you so much. This was so, this was such a good thing to get to listen to and do today. Um, I hope the rest of your day goes well. <laughs>